UW-Madison Department of Anthropology professor John Hawkes is our speaker today. The headline around the globe last September was, Astounding Find in South Africa Adds a New Branch to the Human Family Tree, as reports of the work at Rising Star Cave Expedition near Johannesburg were released to the public at that time. Professor Hawkes was among the researchers being widely quoted. Professor Hawkes is one of the world's foremost scholars in human evolution and says that of the 206 bones in the human body, only about 20 are not represented in that cave. He is going to share the stories of how the remains were found and some of the challenges researchers face to even reach areas of the cave. We look forward to your presentation, Professor Hawkes, and we are making a contribution to the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund as a way of saying thanks for speaking to us today. And as we welcome him to the podium, I want to remind everyone that if time permits, that we will have, um, we will have microphones circulating for questions at the end. So let's please give a warm welcome to Professor Hawk. Thank you so much. All right, I want to thank the program committee for inviting me here. I want to thank all of you for turning out to hear about this. Um, this is work that we've been engaged in since 2013 in South Africa. It has gotten a, a lot of attention, as, as many of you know. And I know a lot of you know some of this story. Some of you will have seen the television program about this story, Dawn of Humanity. Um, I know a lot of you out there are generous supporters of the university and follow a lot of the things that the university does. So, so this is big news. The University of Wisconsin has the largest single contribution to this outside of South Africa. So it is really a major research effort that we've undergone. It has been really a great honor for me to be involved in a project that has had National Geographic and I will say also the University of Wisconsin's media investment in it from the beginning because we have some very unique uh, video footage that covers the entire discovery from the moment that bones were first detected in this cave. And so one of the great pleasures associated with that is that I can tell some things not by telling you, but by allowing people to tell in their own words as they experienced it. So let's see if this video is going to queue up for us. It might take just a second to load because it did earlier. Here we go. Caving has always been great. Um, caving, you want to answer that question of what's around the next corner. That's like always the question you want to know. It's mostly fueled by curiosity. Um, but as you get into caving more and more, the scientific side of it comes into it. You want to know how did these places form? What happened here millions of years ago? What happened here billions of years ago? Basically, it creates a fascination with this whole environment. In my wildest dreams, I would never have thought that caving would take me to what's happening here. <laughs> you could almost call this a bit of an accident. So, my caving buddy and me, Rick, um, we were out exploring this cave on a Friday night. Um, we'd gone into a very remote section of the cave, part that I'd never been in before, and in that section, well, we stumbled upon fossils. <laughs> yeah, at first, um, we didn't exactly know what fossils yet. We started looking around a bit more until we found a mandible, and that was when we knew this was probably hominid. That was when we got, got excited about it. <laughs> and since this discovery, it's <laughs> crazy what's happening here. So my friend Lee Berger has been an explorer in South Africa. He works with National Geographic for his entire career. Um, I've been friends with him for a long time. I've worked with him on some paleoanthropology projects before, but this discovery was really extraordinary. Um, as you guys saw, this is a group of recreational cavers who decided, you know, hey, we'd like to look for fossils sometimes. And they got in touch with Lee and said, you know, we know that you've made some really important discoveries. And are you looking for some people to help you out? Maybe we can find things in these caves that we go into sometimes. Now, in the video, and one of the reasons why I love to show it is that you can see them just squeezing through these totally narrow passages. This is a really unique skill set. And I, I'd like to ask, <laughs> how many of you guys have been in a cave? Yeah. OK, how many of you have been in a cave with the lights totally out, so it's just dark, just pitch black, OK? 
How many of you have been in a cave where you had to squeeze through a passage where both your front and back were, were squeezed against the walls of the cave? Yeah, a few of you. That's a very different kind of scenario. And in this cave, the Rising Star Cave, which lies underneath this hillside, um, underneath that hillside are two kilometers of underground passages. And this is in an area of the world where we, as a field, have been exploring for fossil evidence of human origins, human ancestors, for more than 70 years. So this is a place that's really well explored. This site where we're working is less than a mile away from four other fossil sites with important skeletal remains of early hominid ancestors. Nobody knew that in the two kilometers of underground passages here, there was something more to find. Everybody assumed that there's nothing more out there. And so actually when these guys came and said, would you like to you know, have us look for stuff? Our thought was, and Lee's thought initially was, you know, the first place you look is where you, you are really think you know it really well. And so he sent them into this cave anticipating that they're not going to find something new, but they're going to start to systematize. They're going to start where they know really well and then go outwards from there. No one expected in the first cave they looked at, they would find an undiscovered trove of hominid bones. And I got to tell you, when the pictures came out of the cave, the same pictures you guys were just seeing, when they came out of the cave and Lee sent them to me and said, what do you think about these? we could see in the photographs that there was some sort of early human ancestor that was there. The bones that were just on the surface said, wow, this is not a modern human. There's a jawbone there that looks like it's some sort of early hominin. There's enough bones there to potentially make a skeleton. And I, how many of you guys have heard of Lucy? Yeah, OK. Most famous fossil in the world, probably. And when you look at what Lucy is, she's just in the news this week because they think that she fell out of a tree and have evidence of fractures. Um, that's a skeleton that has maybe 40% of the body represented. And it is one of the most important discoveries that we've ever made. We were looking at the floor of that cave and we could see there's a lot of bones here. This is going to be one of those skeletons. This is going to be a big deal. The problem is, how do you explore a cave like this? And this is a schematic of part of the cave. It's not the whole cave, but it's the part from the entrance that we use to the chamber where we work. And the important thing to see about this is that there are a couple of places in this cave that are extremely narrow. There's a very narrow tunnel called the Superman's Crawl. We call it that because in order for a normal sized person to get through it, you have to do one arm up and one arm down so that your shoulders are minimized and you scooch along. It's about 10 inches top to bottom and you're scooching forward through this. Many of our larger sized team members, if they go through it, it the rocks sort of reaching out at them sort of strip their, their coveralls off. So, so we've got some great video footage of people's sort of <laughs> nethers being exposed. Um, you get really up close and personal when you're caving like that. Obviously, some of you have been in situations like this know how it works. But the more important thing is there's a climb in this cave called the Dragon's Back. It's a natural fall of rock from what was once the cave ceiling and now constitutes a large pile of jagged rocks that our team has to climb up with ropes. And then at the top of that, there is a vertical descent. And when you saw them sort of squeezing into this in the video, what happened was that Steve Tucker, who you were hearing from, they were resting at the top of Dragon's Back. And he wedges his body down into this crack. And he's like, I can't feel the bottom of this with my feet. I wonder what's down there. And so he went down what turned out to be a 40-foot vertical climb with a width. It's a, it's a long crack, but narrow in this dimension. So it pushes against you, and there are jagged rocks. It's got a width of seven and a half inches. That's where these bones are. So in order to explore this chamber and assess what was there, Lee had to recruit a very special team of people. It's not me. I don't fit. <laughs> I, I do lots of things. Um, he put a call on Facebook. He had more than 50 people apply who were qualified in terms of climbing ability, experience in caves, and archaeological skill. He, on the basis of interviews, recruited six 
finalists who came and were part of our underground team. And so these are the folks who were working as archaeologists underground, have been for us during the last three years. Um, one of them is our University of Wisconsin graduate student, Alia Gertoff. Uh, she's there second from the left. She's just finished her PhD and is uh, moving out to Portland uh, to take a new job. Uh, Marina Elliott in the center is uh, now head of our excavation uh, on the team in South Africa. Um, she's from Canada. So we got an international team of archaeologists, super experienced climbers underground, and they went to work. What they discovered by the second day of working underground was they brought up three right thigh bones. You know, So we weren't looking at a skeleton. We were looking at several skeletons. And it rapidly became clear that this deposit of fossils was vastly more than we anticipated it, it could ever be. You know, when you find a partial skeleton, it's one of the biggest discoveries of all time. We suddenly were faced with a deposit that as we began to work on it, not just recovering the bones that were on the surface that you guys saw, but as we began to dig around a skull that was protruding from the surface of the, of the soft sediment that was there, we started to find that that skull was sitting on top of a tangle of other bones. Our team began to call it the puzzle box because as they, with paintbrushes, exposed outwards gradually away from this skull, they showed that these bones are covered one on top of the other, and you have to expose an area before you know what's really on top, before you can remove things. We were working in a solid bed of bone. This was a tremendously unusual context. In most situations in Southern Africa, we have bone that's in hard, concrete-like rock. This was in a very soft, soil-like sediment, very fine particles that we were working with standard archaeological tools. And as our team was working, and this video is just going to be a little short segment of what that work is like, as they were working cautiously on this, we began to realize as they brought up dozen after dozens after dozens of fossils that there were no other animals represented. In every other site where we work, where we have hominin fossil bones, we have the bones of other animals that live along with them. You know, caves collect bones from many kinds of creatures that are using the caves or the prey of carnivore species like leopards that are using the caves. And so we find hominin bones as a very bare minority of what we find. Most of what we find is antelopes and baboons and other kinds of creatures. In this cave, we've got none of that. We've got only hominins and we have a lot of them. This was a unique assemblage. It's something that we had never found before. Now, I do go in the cave. I am useless. I, I, it's sort of a joke for me to be in the cave. Everywhere that there's something interesting, I can't get there. And we're working now on a second site within this cave, another site that has some hominin material. And Lee once went there. I'd say Lee is a little bit thinner than I am. And he's, he's, you know, he's an explorer, right? So he had to go. And, and he went down in, and he couldn't get back out. And so it is really a hazardous working environment. And our team that goes in the cave does so you know, with all kinds of safety protocols and training. Um, and they are remarkable, remarkable people for it. As we packed the material from the cave, we had acquired what was, within three weeks of work, the largest fossil hominin assemblage ever recovered in Africa. And we knew that we had to analyze it in a different way than is typical of, of our field. A lot of you follow human evolution. And you know that there are major discoveries, and it's a jawbone. And sometimes we spend years working on that jawbone, you know, and we do a lot of science on it. You scan it, you look at the scans, you describe it compared to every other fossil that represents the same part. You have to figure out where it is on the family tree. It's a lot of science, and it takes some time. We were dealing with a discovery that was an order of magnitude larger than anything that anybody had ever dealt with before. 
So we put on Facebook a call for young scientists, people who were early in their careers, to come to South Africa to work on this new discovery and to analyze every part of it. We recruited people whose expertise was in the analysis of just hand and wrist bones, people who work on the foot, people who work on the, the pelvis and the skull, and we had eight people working on the teeth. And at the end of this, we had more than 150 people that wanted to come work on it. We were able to support 30 of them to come from all over the world, 15 countries represented, and, and work on the fossil material. The first description that we published last year was the first product of this. Less than two years after our discovery, we discovered through our process of analysis that this was an assemblage that does not fit into any known species, anything that we'd found before. It was something that was new to science and we named it Homo naledi. Naledi in the local language, Sesutu, means star. And we named it for the Rising Star Cave where we found it, but also such an appropriate name considering the, the, real, you know, the young stars that have been involved in the research since the beginning. I, I will say we get some flack from ancient aliens who say, oh, the star people. <laughs> There's something very strange here. There's nothing very strange. Um, it, is, it is, however, something that's distinctly new. Now, I don't go deep into you know, our fossil history in, in a talk like this, but I'll say that a natural question with something new is where does it fit? When we call it Homo naledi, what our team has assessed is that it's similar to other species that, that belong within our own genus, the genus Homo. Homo sapiens is our species. Homo erectus is one of our close relatives. There are earlier kinds of hominins that we call Australopithecus. The Australopiths are like humans in walking, standing upright, but very different from us in having very small brains, very big chewing teeth, and very ape-like anatomy in most respects other than upright walking. Homo naledi fits with our lineage. When I show you this slide of skeletons, I want to say, these are the skeletons. We have hundreds and hundreds of specimens of fossils that represent ancient humans and our relatives and ancestors, but mostly their teeth and jaws, and some skulls, and sometimes you get a piece of a thigh bone, or these are the partial skeletons that we have. There really are fewer than 10 of them representing the first three quarters of our evolutionary history. So when we add an assemblage of, to date, more than 1,500 fossils to that, and say we have more than at least, at least 15 individuals in that, and much of their skeletons, that's really increasing our fossil record by a factor of more than two. Looking at the entire skeleton, I can tell you some interesting things about Homo naledi. Homo naledi is like us in standing upright. It's like us in having very human-like feet. It walked like humans do. It's like us in having a stature which is around that of small-bodied humans, around four foot six to five feet tall. There are people in this room who are that stature. We haven't found a taller individual of this yet, and we've got a lot to work with. So we think this is the range of height that they had, but it's like some very small-bodied human populations today. Um, I will tell you it's very different from us in the size of its brain. Uh, its brain size is about 450 cubic centimeters, which is around a third the size of yours. It's got a small brain, and it's smaller than almost everything else that we place within our genus. That's something that's different about it, and something that puts us sort of on the edge. This is, wow, are we sure this is homo? The reason why we call it homo and are fairly certain about that is that when we look at its anatomy, it is actually much more similar to members of our genus than it is to other kinds of hominins, like the Australopiths. It's got those homo-like characteristics. There we go, okay. Um, this is my friend John Gerchie's best attempt at reconstructing what Homo naledi would have looked like alive. Um, obviously, there's artistic sort of reconstruction going on here, uh, so we can't be sure about things like the skin color and so on, but a lot of it's based on science. Certainly the muscle structure, that's as good as anybody could possibly do. That's, the, that's what the head looked like. Things like, was it covered in hair or was it naked of hair on its face? Those are partially conjecture, but consistent what we, with what we know about other primates. 
As I mentioned, we have at least 15 individuals represented in the cave. We know that from the teeth. We have 190 teeth out of the cave. These represent all ages of individuals. We have babies, young children, older children, adults, at least one old adult, and old in our context. It's, I know that you guys, right? If they had to make the, if they had to write the birthday check, <laughs> we're talking about $35 here. We're not talking really, really old, but that's as old as we find hominins in this kind of population ever got. That's when they've worn out their teeth. So we're looking at, you know, sort of a population of individuals here. One thing I like to point to is the hand. The hand is so evocative because there's so much personality in the hand in a way, but also because it tells us so much about behavior. And Homo naledi has one hand that we found in articulation, all the bones present except for just one little bone, the pisiform bone. And when we look at that hand, it's a very human-like hand. It has broad fingertips as we do for making stone tools, gripping onto things very powerfully. It has a wrist that's well made for manipulating objects, holding things powerfully between the thumb and finger. This is as human a hand as we found in anything before Neanderthals, very close relatives of humans. Um, that being said, it does have very curved fingers, and that's something very unique to us because it probably means that they were, in fact, climbing on curved, what we call substrates, which means really branches. Um, they were climbing on things and doing it habitually. That's why those fingers are curved. Lots of evidence of the foot, a very human-like foot. Um, it's, it's such an interesting mixture of anatomies. And one of the reasons why we are really confident that it's something new is that we've never found a mixture like this before. And this mixture, because we have such a rich collection of fossils, is super well documented. We've got lots of feet that tell us the same thing. We've got lots of hand bones. We've got lots of teeth. They're all very consistent with each other, but different from the mixture of features that we've seen in other relatives of humans. So when you look at something like this, you naturally want to say, well, how is it connected to us? Where does it relate to us? The first thing that people obviously want to know is how old is it? When did it live? We still don't know how old Homo naledi lived, how long ago these creatures existed. Figuring that out requires us to know the geology of the cave in great detail. And our geologists have been working on it, and we're very close to an assessment of what we think the age of the fossils are. We're not yet to the point where we can say, yes, we think the fossils existed at this time. So we go to the next thing, which is family tree. How do they connect to us in our pattern of relationships? They share many features with Homo, but as you guys can tell, things like their small brains and things like their rib cage, which is more primitive looking, their shoulders are sort of can't, that evidence of climbing, those are things we don't find in other species of Homo. We think that this is one of the earliest branching species of Homo that we've found. We think that this is near the origin of our genus in terms of where it connects to us in the family tree. It's a very interesting mixture and one that might tell us more about how we started along that human path. What we don't know is how old it is. Is it something that actually existed at around that time our genus originated, maybe two and a half million years ago? Or is it something that existed much later and survived alongside of other species of evolving hominids, maybe even modern humans? That we don't know yet. That's something that we have yet to discover. We got a lot of attention when this was announced. This is the Vice President of South Africa um, at our announcement. Um, it's, it's quite wonderful to work in a country where there is such support for the science, the recognition that human origins is a unique scientific area where South Africa excels. Uh, our close relationships with South Africa here at the university are really important to us. And the, the reality that we released all of this information out to the public right away, the school groups coming to see the fossils on exhibit as we announced them. We released, I love some of these school group pictures. Um, we released models of the fossils on an open source outlet called MorphoSource. People can download these and print them themselves. We have people printing them all over the world. That kind of sharing is really a first in our field. People don't easily share stuff. 
And so to put it out there and say, look at this, print it, get it in your schools, and talk about it. You know, we want everyone to share the research. This has been an enormous advancement, and one that, that we are certainly going to continue. One that fits with the University of Wisconsin's uh, idea of outreach and, and service to the public. Final thing I want to say, people ask, how did the bones get there? Our best guess for how the bones got there is that Homo naledi put them there. We've excluded a number of scenarios that we find work for other sites. In other kinds of sites, sometimes carnivores accumulate bones. They're prey animals. Those bones are marked by bite marks. They have, they're broken by the teeth of the carnivores. They represent certain parts of the skeleton because carnivores will drag some and not others. It's not true of our assemblage. We, we have no marks on them from carnivores. There's no evidence that water was involved in this. They weren't trapped by a cave-in. Um, these bones were deposited in that chamber over some probably geologically short but not instantaneous period of time. Our best guess is that Homo naledi used this place to deposit its bodies. That is also a first. If it's borne out and we continue to test it, it is something that we've never seen in such a primitive creature before. It's something that humans recognize as something we all treat people specially at the time that they die. Every culture has something like that. We don't know if this is that in a different kind of creature than us, but it would have required some sort of cultural tradition. And that is very meaningful to us as anthropologists. It's something that we are investigating as, as carefully and fully as possible. All right, that's what I have to say about Homo naledi, and that is the fastest I've ever said it. So. <laughs> I do know there are some questions out there. I think we've left some time for some. I'm happy to take them. Um, I know that there's a microphone around. So if, yeah, we make sure that people who want to ask a question get the mic. And I'll take a few. Yeah. Uh, did Lee get out after 45 minutes? <laughs> 45 minutes of straining against the Let walls of that cave. There, yeah, yeah. No, it was not easy to get him out. You know, in principle, if your body fits in, it should fit out. But in reality, as you're climbing, you're using different muscles than when you're descending. Okay. And that makes the difference when the difference is really, you know, millimeters. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. It's, it's very interesting. It makes you proud to be a badger. And uh, the question is, is there any chance of reconstructing DNA from, the, from this? It's a great question. We actually have samples here at the university. We are attempting to get DNA out of them. We don't think that it's, it's not a hopeful situation. Um, we don't know the age of the fossils yet, so we can't say that they're too old for it. But, but the preservation here in this cave, they're, they're wet when they come out of the cave. It's not a cold environment, so it's, it's a warm environment. And that is not usually favorable for DNA preservation, but we are trying everything we can. A quick question about the cave. Uh, obviously, it was very dramatic to get into that, that passage. Is your theory at this point that there, there was a subsequent cave-in that trapped the bones behind it? We believe that the chamber where the bones are, we call it the Dinaletti chamber, and the next door chamber, the dragon's back chamber, have been largely as they are now for, for, since the bones got there. We know that from looking at the sediment in, the, in those chambers. The sediment inside with the bones is very fine. It's composed only of minerals that are coming out of the, the the de decomposition of the rock in the cave. The dragon's back chamber, which is more accessible, has some particles that come from the surface. It has some other fossil material. So we're pretty sure that those have been separate, isolated from each other, except through a very narrow passage, since the bones got there. What we don't know is how difficult it was to get in through the cave. We're working 150 meters underground. And we're not sure if the passage like the Superman's crawl has always been as difficult as it is now. We think that it's essential to the story that the chamber was difficult for Homo naledi to reach. Otherwise, we'd find other animals there. But we don't think that they necessarily went through the same arduous pathway that our team does today. Um, I was going to ask you if you knew how old they were yet, because that was obviously one of the things people are waiting on. But um, I, I read the story in the New Yorker about a month or two ago, which oh I, sure yeah, which I found really fascinating yeah. and, and got me interested in this. And and much of that story, uh, I would say, was a criticism of Lee Berger as being half showman and half scientist. 
um, in, in the way that he did some of this. And I, I would just like to have you, who were mentioned in there, in that article as one of yeah. his uh, friends and supporters, just comment on some of those criticisms that have been made of him. Oh, absolutely. You know, Lee has worked for, you know, with National Geographic very closely since the 90s. And they've been great supporters of his work. National Geographic is a media organization, you know. They do the things that they do, they fund the work that they do because it has that kind of profile. You know, it's, it's not only about the science that you do, it's about making sure that the public and the society is participating in the science as much as possible. Um, you know, my, a lot of scientists don't like that idea. Uh, a lot of scientists really want things to be very private, very secretive. Um, I have great friends in science who really feel that it's not proper to talk about what they're working on in front of public. And, and only communicate with the public through press releases from their university press office, only at the time of, you know, some... It is really different culturally. Um, my own attitude, you know, you guys can probably tell, I do a lot of public speaking. <laughs> we do a lot of media. We at the university are very committed to making sure that as much as possible, we're, you know, this is a field where we're not going to, we don't heal diseases. You know, I tell th people things about their history. And history is what connects us as a species. And so if I'm going to be effective at that, I really feel strongly that I have to do that with people. You know, I have to be out there. I have to be talking to people. I have to be engaging people in this exploration because that's what it takes for us to be successful. Um, it is, it's not a surprise to me, right, when, when I and our team are criticized for being open and being accessible. Um, but it is sort of a disappointment because I sort of feel like, yeah, I don't, I don't have that much fun sitting in a closet with my bones, you know. I, I, really, want, <laughs> I really want people to, to be engaged in it. Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Okay, final question, yeah? Yes, does carbon dating uh, play any role in this? Uh, carbon for... dating is the most well-known form of dating uh, and the most accurate, uh, but radiocarbon has a half-life of 5730 years, uh, 5730. So after that period of time, half the carbon-14 is gone. After double that period of time, 10,000 years, a fourth of it is left. After Four times, it, it radically depletes. And so in fact, after about 50,000 years of time, there's no carbon-14 left enough for us to date. We don't know for sure what the date is. I will say that, you know, I'm not ruling out that it might be radiocarbon age, but it would be surprising if it were. We are using techniques right now that involve the, the magnetic fields of electrons that are knocked loose by radioactivity in the soil. This is called electron spin resonance, and it works on teeth. And so we do have some methods of direct dating the, the fossils themselves. Those methods are unfortunately destructive. They require us to destroy some of these precious fossils. And so every time we make a decision about what we need to do, we're very cautious about selecting as little as possible and proceeding one step at a time. All right, thank you again so much for having me. I hope you enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you so much, John. Our meeting is adjourned. <laughs>